to see my slides and hear me? Absolutely. Thank you, Alex. Okay. You're good to go. All right. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thanks for joining us for this first presentation about evaluation of the SDR boards and tool chains. I will be mostly focusing on uh, or focusing on evaluation of the SDR boards in this uh, presentation because of the time constraints. And as I assume most of you uh, are familiar with software defined radios, otherwise you probably will, would not be here. And you are probably also well aware that we have seen a huge development in the availability of software defined radio devices over the last 10, 12, 13 years in the sense that they have become uh, we get more and more devices on the market. They have more and more features, uh, and they also come with, at, at a lower and lower cost, some of them at least. And uh, that has been a great, uh, great thing because uh, it has because it becomes more, uh, more uh, accessible. More and more people get interested in radio communications, even people who are just interested in electronics or some hacking, this and that. Uh, they find the radio communication an interesting thing, an interesting tool. From a satellite communication perspective, it has also made a great uh, difference because we can build, for example, uh, quite high performance ground stations at a very low cost. In particular, since uh, the software defined radios allows us great flexibility in terms of uh, receiving and transmitting signals with the same radio device. On this slide, you can see a picture of a typical ground station. This one is from uh, the European Space Astronomy Center in Spain, where on the right side you see the rack with power supplies, power amplifiers, and uh, we probably cannot see it, but on the in, around the middle in the right side they have two hack RF devices they used for receiving and transmitting. Now, one of the problems with uh, with uh, many of the software-defined radios uh, commonly available is that. Uh, uh, there's not a lot of uh, performance data available with it when you look at the websites. They all advertise with this is a great device. It has high sensitivity, huge dynamic range, and uh, it can solve all your problems and whatnot. But when you're actually looking for some actual measurements or numbers for uh, sensitivity or dynamic range uh, or well, resolution uh, or ac actually practical <laughs> resolution, uh, you don't find much. So. One of the objectives of uh, this activity was to take a number of devices uh, that are interesting for satellite communications and uh, do a survey of, the, of uh, those devices, both uh, analytical in terms of uh, how much frequency they cover, how much bandwidth, what resolution they provide, but also perform some uh, lab tests uh, measuring their uh, sensitivity and dynamic range, uh, look at the spectral purity, uh, which, which is because one of the problems with these boards is that on a very small uh, printed circuit board, you have a very wide uh, RF front end and the high speed digital electronics. And uh, that's uh, like uh, a recipe for disaster if you don't do it right. <laughs> so we performed some lab tests on them, uh, both the receivers and transmitters. And finally, also some on air tests to test them. How do they actually perform in a real uh, life or in a practical scenario. We try to include as many devices as possible. Well, not as many as possible, but try to cover a wide range. So going from the cheapest RTL SDR dongle to the more expensive uh, one, the more, most expensive we had was a USRP B210. And uh, we were limit, we limited our scope to to measure on uh, on frequencies that are uh, relevant for satellite communications because otherwise we could have spent quite a lot of time one of the important uh, objectives from at least my point of view was to try to measure using relatively simple and repeatable methods so not an expensive rf lab uh, isolated from the rest of the world but try to measure under scenarios under conditions that you would actually use these devices because i think it's it, it's it's quite irrelevant how uh, how sensitive a device is when it's isolated from the rest of the world if you are going to use it at a university where you have wi-fi and all sorts of other signals in the air 
So, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we looked at the technical specifications. We uh, measured the receiver performance and most notably the noise figure or the sensitivity, uh, di the dynamic range and uh, looked at the spectral purity. For those devices that supported the transmission, we tried to measure the output power, uh, modulation quality using a, a DVBS2 signal and also the linearity, uh, which was or, or not the linearity of the device itself, but uh, the uh, how the linearity between setting the gain and the output power, so uh, how predictable it was, and finally the on-air uh, performance. This is the list of the devices we have tested. Uh, you are probably familiar with most of them. Um, as you can see, they are uh, well. Most of them are cover, uh, or all of them cover VHF and UHF, and some of them can go up all, all the way to six gigahertz. Uh, in terms of frequency and uh, some are only receivers, some are transceivers. Uh, we only tested the transceiver devices that were, uh, that are capable of full duplex operation because uh, for satellite operation, that's a quite important thing. Otherwise you would need two devices. And uh, yeah, so they range from uh, 35 euros from the cheapest device to about 1400 euros for the most expensive device. This just this is just a quick uh, look at uh, our uh, test setup or the receiver test setup just to illustrate uh, how we did it. We uh, most of the receiver tests we have done with a signal generator, generating a signal and uh, simply measuring what was the minimum detectable signal uh, using a, a, a software specifically written for this purpose. We tried to, we in, considered using different software or ex existing software, uh, but uh, in the end, we con concluded that if we want to know precisely what's going on, and since software is a very important part of a software defined radio setup, obviously, then we really had to know what's going on. So it was easier just to spend some time on writing the software and, uh, and using that. Uh, we, all, we have for the noise figure measurements, we also used another method uh, uh, called the Y factor method, which instead of signal generator uses a calibrated noise source. That's a more accurate method in general because it gives or gives better results. But the problem with that is that a noise source is more expensive. A calibrated noise source is more expensive than a, a signal generator that most many people might have in, have uh, lying around. But it was good to do the, those tests as well, at least to confirm that uh, our test method and test setups were giving the same results. And this is an example of uh, the noise figure measurements we've got. Uh, this is for the Blade RF uh, device that you might know. And you can see the, the lines are the measurements we have done for using the signal generator and the dots are uh, are measured using the noise source. You can see they are quite uh, uh, they, they are quite consistent with each other, except for uh, one frequency on uh, 1280 megahertz. That can be uh, due to, for example, with the signal generator, we have longer cables or uh, this, some noise coming in through the signal generator. And uh, but in most cases, we had very good uh, agreement between the. the the measurements done using the signal generator and uh, the noise source. And so, yeah, this uh, basically uh, tells you that for a given gain setting on the device, uh, your device will have a specific noise figure. And uh, of course, most people are interested, uh, well, which is the most sensitive device? <laughs> uh, because, yeah, it's in, in some cases it might be interesting, but in most practical cases, it's not so important. But um, as you can see, some uh, 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 not surprisingly, the device uh, that had the best the noise figure or the mo most sensitive device was the SDR play. And that's probably because they have a quite good front end with uh, uh, front end sp filters for specific frequency ranges. So that uh, and a lot of amplification in, in uh, the front end. But uh, in most practical cases, uh, the the noise figure or the sensitivity of the device is not so uh, interesting because uh, if you also measure the dynamic range of the device or what is the most 
uh, what is the strongest signal your device can tolerate before it overloads, then obviously when you turn the gain up to the maximum, it will be most susceptible to overload. And uh, this, uh, this graph shows, uh, well, it's practically all the results we had in one graph, taking the noise, noise figure of the device and what is the maximum input power they can tolerate at that uh, noise figure or at that gain setting. And not surprisingly, uh, the higher the gain or the more sensitive the device, the lower the maximum input power you can, it can tolerate. Plus for us, it was quite surprising that uh, the Pluto SDR uh, was one of the one that could, uh, uh, or with the highest dynamic range in this case. Uh, for the transmitter tests, uh, we uh, we also me we measured the the output power we can get. Uh, there is not so much to say for it. They are except that some devices can give slightly more uh, power than others. What what I think is interesting uh, in this context or in this uh, graph is that there is quite good linearity uh, for all uh, all of the devices that we measured. So, which which means that when you set the gain, uh, when you, when you move the gain by, let's say, uh, ten, then it will uh, increase with a certain amount of dB, and that's uh, that makes it uh, very practical when you have to use them in a practical setups. So finally, uh, for the one air on air tests, uh, we selected uh, two devices that were uh, rather different. We took the SDR play device um, and a USRP. They are different in the sense that uh, the SDR play is uh, is one of the lower cost devices. I think the one we used is not the most, not not the cheapest one, but it's uh, it's one of I think it's around 200 euros it costs, and it has two uh, receivers that can run in parallel, and uh, therefore it's quite interesting for a satellite setup or a satellite receiving station because it could receive let's say VHF and UHF at the same time. And uh, we took the USRP B210 because that was also one of the best performing devices during our test. And we let them simply run in a setup where they were using the same antennas, uh, the same preamplifiers, same filters, and the signal split out to the two receivers running in parallel using the same satellite passes for uh, 48 hours. And as we can see, they were virtually identical uh, in in uh, terms of how many packets they received. Now, uh, these results uh, can be probably tweaked uh, in both directions by uh, trying to tweak the gain settings of the devices. It's uh, It can be a little difficult uh, to hit uh, right uh, right away, but uh, we did our best to to um, to uh, have a have a quite reliable results in the sense that it was Pretty much what we expected. That we also it was it was running in the ground station where that we are running 24/7 uh, using other SDR devices, uh, so they are quite consistent with uh, the result we we have uh, been expecting. Alex, friendly reminder, you're on 13th minute. Yes, uh, I am actually done. This is my last slide <laughs> with the conclusion and. Uh, yeah, there is not much uh, to say. We, we have tested SDR device, uh, seven SDR devices, and I think what's the most important outcome of it is the data that we have got. So when you are looking for an SDR device for the setup, don't ask somebody what is the best one that I should buy because it depends on your needs. Do you need a sensitive device? Do you need one with a high dynamic range? Uh, if you know that, you can look at the data and uh, make your choice based on that. And uh, yeah. Basically, I'm uh, done with this. Thank you, Alex. That was super interesting uh, to see again. <laughs> <laughs> the, the results are always like, uh, especially the conclusion, uh, good reminder for many of the questions that we were getting about, you know, what's what's most suitable or not. So I can see uh, Frank has two questions. Frank, um, feel free to <laughs> voice the questions yourselves. Yeah, I was uh, wondering, uh, Alex, uh, the gain figure, you gain setting you mentioned for either TX or RX, is that now corresponding to some 
of the parameters that you see in, in the various GNU radial uh, source or sync blocks? Is there a one-to-one -one correspondence? I, I thought there's maybe a few GNU radial people interested in that. Thanks. Uh, no, unfortunately not, and that's one of the um, one of the challenges with comparing the devices. What we have done in the test software is to implement uh, one uh, uniform gain setting. Uh, and uh, for some devices, it's already implemented by the driver or the backend that you can uh, set just one gain. Uh, for uh, uh, some of the others, well, actually, um, yeah. <laughs> So yes and no, actually for most devices, there is only one gain setting like the RTL, SDR, dongle, and also the USRPs, for example, they provide uh, an interface for just setting one gain level. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't, uh, to be honest, I don't remember it so long ago, uh, but I think uh, the SDR play, for example, they are a little more tricky uh, because of the way they made the gain API. So no, unfortunately not, and that is why uh, we, when we presented the dynamic range, we we decided to kind of normalize it so to use the the noise figure on the x-axis instead of the gain setting, because then at least we have uh, we have something comparable. Uh, I think in, for most devices, uh, what, what I, in my experience, you will, uh, mo most of the time in a practical setup where you have pre-amplifiers and filters in front of the device, you will probably be around the, uh, around the middle of the gain range. <laughs> that's, uh, I think that's a quite uh, safe uh, bet. <laughs> Maybe I have one other question related to measurements. Uh, it's related to the use of SAT SAGEN, the let's say open source uh, um, spectrum analyzer and then and the signal generator. Um, one thing I, I did not really understand with the, the transmitting transmitter output power, in particular for the Pluto SDR. So you use here SAT Gen as a generator. Of a CW, but also as a measurement device, or was there a calibrated power measurement afterwards? No, the set set again uh, software we only used for uh, transmitting a CW signal with the Pluto SDR because uh, the 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 backend, the GNU radio backend, was not working uh, at that time of the tests. Uh, so we only used it for generating a CW signal. All the receiver measurements were done uh, uh, using a signal, a physical signal generator, and a calibrated noise source, and the test software we have written. I see. And could you then still uh, the power detector? How was that implemented uh, and calibrated? Yeah, the power detector was a spectrum analyzer. I see. Yeah. So uh, physical so spectrum analyzer. Yeah. So, so the power measurements are are actually uh, physical <laughs> power measurements, so DBMs. Yeah, thank you, uh, Alex. Yeah. I can see there is another question about the report itself. I'm going to be pasting it here also as a link. And uh, there's another question about uh, whether uh, there is a significant difference between calibrating with CW and the AWGN source. Uh, which source, sorry? I think uh, the question is about the AWGN source, but I think that... Uh... The, noise, the noise generator. Ah, okay. And so the question is, what is uh, the, the difference? Did you notice any significant difference uh, when you when you calibrated using the CW uh, versus uh, calibrating with the um, noise source? Do you, uh, do you, in other words, do you recommend using a CW in general? Uh, no, I, I will actually, if you have a, a, a calibrated noise source available, that will give you the best results, uh, undoubtedly. Um, the, the only uh, issue with the noise source is that if you don't have it, it's quite expensive. And uh, they have a limited range. Uh, so the one we had uh, had uh, were usable for the low uh, noise figures, 
Um, but uh, with the signal generator, on the other hand, you can measure all the way up, uh, uh, well, if it's uh, interesting in, uh, anyway. So uh, if you want to measure the lowest noise uh, noise figure of the device, then the noise source is will, in most cases, or I think it's quite sure to say that in all cases, it will give more accurate results. Okay, and we are on the 20 minute mark. Uh, there's another final question, maybe that's an easy one. Did you assess the ease of usability of its of the SDR platforms, Alex? And that would be the final question. Please repeat the, the question. Uh, if you uh, did an assessment of ease of usability for each of the SDR platforms. Uh, yes, uh, we, we have uh, at least considered the, the what uh, how the driver is available and uh, uh, the software support for it. Uh, um, and we can say that for all all except the SDR plate devices, uh, the drivers are open source. So uh, that makes it okay. So easily uh, accessible or available in many uh, software uh, or end user applications. Um, so yeah, it's, I think, uh, all, all, of, all of the devices that we tested are nowadays quite well supported uh, because of uh, the various uh, uh, wrapper layers, also in GNU radio uh, with GR SOPI that will be mentioned later. So uh, yeah, but uh, in any case, when, when you want to buy devices, definitely check uh, if you want to use some end user application, definitely check how well it's supported uh, because uh, yeah, it's... Uh, you never know. <laughs> cool. So uh, thank you, Alex, for the presentation and the answer to the questions. And we're going to be moving forward with the next presentation, which is the direct sampling subactivity by Christophe Donzelot. Christophe, the floor is yours.